Hi, I'm Landon Whitsitt. Welcome back to Theo Academy and our series on the foundations of Presbyterian discipleship. In this final lesson, we want to talk about fellowship and mission. And I want you to know these ideas just might be the most important ones that we talk about. Again, it is vital that we understand God's grace, what it means to turn from sin and evil, and to name Jesus as Lord and Savior. But from the moment that God told Abraham to leave his father, the people of God have always understood that we are blessed to be a blessing. In the Presbyterian church, we like to say that God has called us as a people. We are the body of Christ, the scriptures say, and we are each individually members of that body. We each have different gifts to bring to the work of the church, but no one person has everything that is needed for our communities to do what they have been called to do. And that means we have to be in relationship with other people. I, I believe you cannot believe in Jesus Christ all by yourself. You can't. And if you go through the, um, just even the Gospels, notice that Christ never calls people all by themselves. He's always call, calling people in community. And he's always calling people to abide with him in together in community. So when you come to church by yourself, it, the, one of the reasons why I think we gather and worship together is because you get the full spectrum and the view of God in everybody else that's in that room and how they exercise grace and how they sing and how they hear the word of God and reflect it back and how they pray together for one another and the world, that one hour, two hours right there in community is a glimpse of God. Then what enhances that and what keeps that and glues that together is by getting to know one another. Most congregations have simple things they do to try and help people get to know one another. The most basic of these is the fellowship hour after worship. You know the drill. You exit the sanctuary and you file into a room somewhere where some faithful souls have brewed a pot of coffee that, that might taste a little burnt and, and they set out a plate of cookies that, that might be a little bit stale. And it's easy to overlook this moment. If you're new and you show up to the fellowship time, often you're not exactly sure who you're supposed to introduce yourself to. I think the intent of coffee and fellowship is after people worship for them to gather and really reestablish connections with one another before they run off um, to, to go about their day. I look at coffee and fellowship more as a pause button. It really should be that before those who are coming to your church for the first time to those who come to your church regularly, before they move out the door, it's a pause. And that pause, what I always tell people before they leave um, ap after the benediction, is meet someone that you haven't had an opportunity to meet, or just stay a few seconds and allow yourself to be met. And that's what coffee and fellowship should be about. That it is just a pause between walking from the sanctuary to the front door and you are allowing a few seconds to build a connection or reestablish a connection that you haven't had an opportunity to do. I think because that is intimidating, it's intimidating to meet new people. It's intimidating to allow people to meet you. But if you can just look at it as just a f five seconds, stand still in one spot, <laughs> it may change your life. It may change your life. It may not, but it may change your life. I agree. That pause button just might change your life. I have seen it time and again. In one congregation that I served, the fellowship committee didn't just put out some coffee and, and a plate of cookies. They had members of the church sign up to host fellowship every single week. 
That time of connection and hospitality has become so important that, in that community, almost more important than the worship service itself. People will always linger around tables or in hallways, having deep conversations with one another about life and love, about joys and sorrows. And through those relationships, over a styrofoam cup of coffee, faith is formed. And it is the content of that faith that is so fascinating Because of the joy those members find in one another, they are always hatching plans for how they can extend that fellowship out into the wider community. This matches very well what our book of order says when it talks about one of the great themes of the Reformed tradition. It says that Presbyterians understand that we have been called to service as well as salvation. Frankly, friends, it's all leading up to this. God's grace and the work of Jesus Christ, all of that leads us to a place where we recognize that God's work in our own lives is to guide, direct, and enable us to serve others. That means we have to go find those other people and serve them. This is what we mean when we talk about mission. We think because of a building structure, we have to convince people to come to us. But this building structure is really just a place where we can practice. It's our laboratory. But where church really needs to happen is out there. And we just need to assess and observe people in our neighborhood and go where they're at already. Um, I think the obstacle about mission is we try to, the old school um, of mission is, what can I do for you? And that's always hard to figure out. I'm trying to figure out what I can do for you, but I don't know you. So I don't know your context, your needs, but I really want to do something for you. Versus, if mission really is about building relationships, then the need and how to serve one another is then natural. It's mutual. And it's honestly, not that hard. I think when we think of mission as a product where I give to you, hoping the product may be your life will be better, or gratitude, or something like that, then um, it becomes, mission, I think, becomes stale and irrelevant. But if mission's based on relationships and building, then it continuously grows and changes. And then you don't have to worry about figuring out how to serve them. You already know because you've been in relationships and you will find out ways that they are already serving you. Mission doesn't have to be hard. It is as simple as knowing who the people are around you, becoming their friends, and then doing whatever it takes so that your new friends can be more fully human. This is going to mean that we are going to write letters to our government officials. It's going to mean that we are going to swing a hammer and and build a house. It's going to mean that we are going to make sure that there are kids' backpacks full of food when they go home on the weekends. Whatever you see around you that your new friends have need of, that is what you will do. For Teresa and her church, one story demonstrated the simplicity of helping out their friends. Uh, You know, it started, um, it was the 10th anniversary of 9-11, and you could feel kind of the heaviness all across the nation. And I just thought, what is a simple way? You know, we could hold a vigil here, we can open up our doors, we could have a service, but what's a more simple way, as people are going about their lives, to be able to express Grieving, gratitude, whatever it is that they need to express. And I just remember my kids love to draw on the sidewalk. And I have a lot of sidewalk chalk. And so I just put it in a bucket with a sign that said, you know, in remembering 9-11, write a word, draw something, write a blessing. And at first it was what I expected. Children were drawing happy faces and pictures. But then I literally 
caught people littering the sidewalk, full of thanking the service people around them, or writing the dates of their loved ones who had passed away, um, or you know, praying for peace. And what was beautiful is it was a time when it was our rainy season in San Francisco. And so the rain would wash it away. Like, let all that go. And then the next day, it would be littered again with more prayers and blessings. We didn't gain anything by it. We didn't, I don't know if it bettered anybody's lives, but it was about our church giving an opportunity to build a relationship with our community, inviting them to, you know, do whatever in their faith words, right, what they, they needed at that time. They got to claim what they needed, and we just gave them the space and the tools to do it. And that was it. Mission can be a scary word. Many of us don't feel like we're called to anything, that, that we don't have the goods to really make a difference in the name of Jesus Christ. But nothing could be further from the truth. God has put something special deep inside all of us. It's, it, it's like what we tell the kids in Sunday school. God doesn't make junk. But the truth is, we are often the last people who are good at seeing our own gifts. The Bible is full of stories of people not believing that they had what it took to accomplish a task until someone showed them what they couldn't see about themselves. But the twin ideas of, of fellowship and mission remind us that actually the point of our faith is simply to build relationships. Fellowship and mission are really just two fancy church words for building relationships with people you know and with people you don't. When you become friends with someone, you want to help them. It doesn't matter if they are a church member or not. I hope you've enjoyed your time with this series on Foundations of Presbyterian Discipleship. And we know that God will hold you as you discern your place in your congregation. Peace be with you.